how do we view the importance of purity and holiness in our lives today? Do we view them as just good virtues and that's as far as it goes? Or do we try to live the lives that demonstrate purity and holiness in our thoughts and words and deeds? If I was to ask you to put your hand up if you'd ever told a lie, I wonder how many actually would. In reality, probably all of us have told a lie at some point, even if it was way back when we were learning to speak and a toddler and we'd been told not to touch something and we did and then our parents said to us, did you touch that? And we are like, no, um, or something like that. I'm sure we have all told a lie at some point. Or maybe it was one of those kind of bigger lies, you know, like, uh, darling, do I look fat in this suit? And as wives, of course, we would say to our husbands, no, you look lovely, when in reality, we can see that those donuts he consumed half an hour ago have already made it their way to his tummy. Today, we look at the story of Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter five, verses one to 11. And this was at a critical juncture for the early church. And this shocking story shows us that to God, purity and holiness were vitally important in the New Testament church. And they were also important today as much as they were back then. So let's read uh, chapter five, verses one to four. Let's break this story down as we go. Acts chapter five, verses one to four. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said to Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your control? Why then have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young men arose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. So this whole situation that occurs with Ananias and Sapphira comes off the back of the account of Barnabas at the end of chapter four. Let me just read that to you. Acts chapter four, verses 36 and 37 says, and Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. The selling of, of houses was not unique. And to Barnabas, and others, many others, were doing the same kind of thing. But Luke names Barnabas specifically at this juncture, likely because of his future role in the church. He was a man of notoriety, not just because he sold this land and laid the money at the apostles' feet, but also because of what he did as he continued to journey uh, with the early church and explore what his role was, what God had for him to do. And so he receives this name Barnabas by the, uh, the apostles, which means son of encouragement because it's by his character he was an encourager he was an encourager to the apostles he was an encourager to the early church so Ananias and Sapphira must have seen this and wanted some of that affirmation some of that notoriety that Barnabas had for themselves it's easy when we see other people who are honoured publicly for something that they have done to want some of that for ourselves. We want to be known. We want to be recognised. It's kind of, I suppose you could say, part of the human condition. We want to be loved. We want to be known as part of the family. And, and that's, in one sense, not a wrong thing. We don't want to be invisible to people around us. But we want to make sure that we don't try and push ourselves to the head to be known for something and to lie and deceive our way to get to the top, as Ananias and Sapphira found. So Ananias and Sapphira see what has happened to Barnabas, no doubt want some of this notoriety that he received, and therefore sell some land that they own. 
And they're in agreement about this. It's not something one of them does and then tells the other. They're in agreement about the fact that they sell this land and they sell it for a certain price, which we're not told in the story. And they bring the money and they lay it at the feet of the apostles. Now, there's some important things to note here. Selling the land was not wrong. Having the money given in their possession was not wrong. It's important we know those two things. It was theirs to do with as they saw fit. But what was wrong was twofold. Firstly, it was wrong that they coveted the praise, affirmation and notoriety that Barnabas received, wanting it for themselves to be named, to be famous in the early church for their wonderful and generous gift. That was wrong. And the second thing that was wrong was they lied about what they gave. They gave the impression that they'd given it all, when in fact they kept some back for themselves. Now, even keeping some of the money back for themselves in and of itself was not wrong. After all, it was their money to do with as they wanted. There was no command from God or from the apostles to sell possessions or sell land. It was the moving of the Holy Spirit, a response to what the Holy Spirit was doing and to the message of the gospel that led people to sell land, to sell possessions, to be generous in what they've been given. But they gave the impression that they'd given all the money to the church when in fact they hadn't. That was the sin. So let me say again, keeping some of the money back, that was okay. If they'd said, look, you know, uh, we're keeping all the money, or if they'd given, you know, some of it and said that we've sold this piece of land, we're giving half of it to the church, that would have been fine. The sin that Ananias and Sapphira did, or the second part of the sin Ananias and Sapphira did, was to to lie about what they gave. Peter said, did you sell the land for such and such? They said yes, when in fact they hadn't. They'd sold it for more. They led the apostles to believe they'd given all the money to the church, when in fact they'd actually only given some of it and kept some of it back. They'd lied about how much they gave. Peter, the Apostle Peter, now has this moment of divine inspiration from the Holy Spirit. You know, as we're open to what the Holy Spirit does in our lives, we have these divine moments where the Holy Spirit speaks to our heart. We just know something is right. We feel challenged. We feel stirred in our heart. It's something that we kind of couldn't have known by ourselves, or even if we could have done, we know that it wasn't just ourselves that thought it. We know there's an impact in our spirit where the Holy Spirit has spoken to us and revealed something. And if that's happened to you, you will know what that is. You will have experienced that and know that kind of feeling, that sense in your spirit that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. So Peter has this divine inspiration from the Spirit and he says in Acts chapter five, verses three and four, I'll read it again. He says, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Now bear in mind at this time, Ananias was there by himself, okay? His wife wasn't present. And this response that he got from Peter was far from the response that he was hoping to get. He's like a rabbit caught in the headlights, if you can kind of picture that. He doesn't know you know, what do I do? Do I run out? Do I stay where I am? Do, what do I say? What do I not say? He was caught in the headlights, right? Ananias' deception is made public to the people that were there. God knows all our sins and he may use a fellow member of the church to challenge us about our sin and to call out what we think is secret. Now, I don't think um, that the Holy Spirit will con- conceive in, uh, to, to inspire in somebody's heart Uh, to get up on a Sunday morning, come to the front of the church, point at someone and say, God says you have been sinned. I don't quite think that's how it works. I think, you know, God is more gracious than that. But it may be that someone comes to us in person and asks us a question about something or challenges us about something. Or maybe maybe we've been mentored. Um, A few weeks ago, I spoke, uh, we had a sermon looking at Esther and I talked about one of the blessings that people bring God into our lives to mentor us, to disciple us and help us. And it may be that someone like that challenges us about a sin um, in our lives. But God knows our sins. And whilst God may speak to us and convict us through his Holy Spirit, it may be that we need to be convicted by somebody else challenging us, a fellow brother or sister in Christ who challenges us. Let's read on in the story. 
uh, Acts chapter 5, verses uh, 5 to 6. Then Ananias heard these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear uh, came upon all those who heard these things. And the young men arose and wrapped him up, carried him out and buried him. So the next thing is truly shocking, right? Here's Ananias, he's brought this money in. Uh, he thinks he's going to get credibility, notoriety for his wonderful and generous gift. Um, but Peter challenges him and he falls down dead. Now, Peter was as likely surprised at what had happened as the other people were there, and probably Ananias was as well. Uh, he hadn't commanded the death sentence. He hadn't intended the death sentence. He just confronted Ananias about his sin of lying and deception. It was God who deemed the punishment fit for the crime. And naturally, as the scripture says, great fear came upon all those who heard these things. I mean, it, you would be, right? If you were in a group of people, perhaps your life group, and, and one of your life group leader challenges you about a sin and you suddenly fall down dead, you could imagine the rest of your life group would be a little bit shocked about it, right? And, and this is what happened. And the young men come in and they pick Ananias up and they take him out, they wrap him up and they bury him. Why? Because burials were common um, in that part of the world at that kind of pace, at that speed. Because the weather being so hot meant that people uh, naturally would decay, disease would spread quickly. Um, and so burial had to be carried out as fast as possible. Now let's read on in the story. Let's read chapter 5, verses uh, 7 to 11. Now it was about three hours later when his wife, that's Ananias' wife, um, came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered her, tell me whether you sold the lamb for so much. She said, yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard uh, these things. I always wonder uh, how the news of Ananias' death did not reach Sapphira's ears for three hours. And I also wonder, as Sapphira was on her way to uh, meet Peter, and no doubt wanted to catch up with Ananias as well, you know, people weren't looking at her, looking shocked. And, you know, naturally, you, you know, you think if that was happening, Anna, uh, Sapphira would be like, why are these people looking at me like this? You know, I mean, this is something that's just happened. Her husband has died, just fallen down dead. Um, and, and you could imagine that kind of news, which sparked fear in people, it, how has it not reached um, Sapphira's ears? Whatever, you can imagine that the atmosphere would have been really uh, tense at this time. So Sapphira comes in and Peter immediately confronts her as he did with Ananias. But interestingly, Peter says something different to Sapphira than he did to Ananias. He says to Sapphira, look, the feet of those who buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. So perhaps as he saw how God had punished Ananias and the fact the crime was like a joint crime, Peter assumed that God would do the same to Sapphira. Or maybe God revealed the sentence of death uh, or Sapphira's death to Peter. And so he could just say it to her. Either way, Sapphira lies to Peter, lies to the Holy Spirit, therefore, um, and falls down dead and is buried and people carry her out and bury her next to her husband. Now that's the story. There's a lot we don't know uh, from the story. A lot of things we're not told though. Did Ananias and Sapphira have children? If they did, uh, were they young? If they were young, who looked after them when Ananias and Sapphira fell down dead? How did their other family members respond, even if they didn't have children? How did the other family members respond? How did their family and friends handle the grief of this situation? We're not told those things, and so we shouldn't speculate about them. But we can draw some powerful lessons from this story. So I just want to draw out four brief things for us to reflect upon and apply to our lives today. Firstly, at this juncture, the church was in its infancy. It was very small by today's standards, and so it was at a very vulnerable stage in its life. Controversy in the sin, in the church rather, 
and the sin of lying to God was so severe and could have had such a dangerous impact left unchecked that God dealt with it quickly and severely. He like nearly nipped it in the bud. The reputation of the church was at such an important stage of its life, a strong message had to be sent about what would be tolerated and what wouldn't. And the, the fact that the behavior of Ananias and Sapphira was not gonna be tolerated by God. In fact, it's no small wonder that God did to what he did to Ananias and Sapphira. It's actually more of a wonder that God doesn't do that same thing to us today. So I think the first thing we need to reflect on is that this was something that happened at the church when the church was at a vulnerable stage in its life. But we need to reflect on our own sin and recognise that the scripture says God is the same yesterday, today and forever. It is by God's grace, through the power of the cross, through the shed blood of Jesus, that we can now come before God and confess our sins to him. And even when we do sin and we keep it secret and we lie, Let's not abuse God's grace. Let's recognise our sin for what it is. Let's confess our sin and give thanks that because God is gracious and merciful, he gives us that time to confess our sin, to get our sin right and not to strike us down dead instantly like he did Ananias and Sapphira. Second thing, we don't always understand why God does what he does and acts the way he acts. He never acts wrongly, he never sins, he never makes a mistake. But his response, as we look at this story, could appear unloving and unmerciful. But we shouldn't think that Ananias and Sapphira didn't go to heaven because we could think, well, that was it. They, you know, they obviously didn't go to heaven. That was unfair. No, we shouldn't think that. Just because they sinned and lied to God doesn't mean that they invalidated their salvation. They just hastened their journey toward heaven. Bear in mind that this is New Testament times when this story happened. And we are still in New Testament times today. I think we forget that sometimes, but we're still in New Testament times today. And I think sometimes we don't view our sin as severely as we should. We don't view holiness and purity as essential today when actually they should be. On the one hand, seeking forgiveness is easy to do, but do we view it as being so easy that by our actions we treat God's grace and mercy with contempt? Remember verse 11, so great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. So are you feeling fearful now? I'm talking about the reverend fear of God, a respectful fear about our fragility in the shadow of Almighty God. Just think about that for a second. I'm not talking about fear like yet fear of spiders or fear of heights or fear of the unknown when perhaps we contract an illness, we don't know how it's going to transpire. No, I'm talking about respectful fear, about reverent fear, recognising, if you like, our weakness, our fragility, our humanness in the shadow of Almighty God. Let's just think about for that second, because as we do that, as we recognise who we are and we recognise how good and great God is, it shines a light on us and his love for us, but that also exposes the sin in our life that we need to confess and get right. And the scripture says, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all our righteousness. So we don't need to be afraid of him um, in, in that sense. We just need to be, have a respectful fear of him, recognise our sin, confess our sin as soon as he reveals it to us. As soon as we know we've sinned, confess our sin. Uh, and he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Because sometimes we can sin, we can get something wrong, and then we kind of, it could be because we didn't know we were gonna sin, and then we do and we realize, or sometimes it's because we willfully sin. We know we shouldn't do something, but we give in to that temptation. And we think, well, I, I've got to wait some time now before I confess my sin. You know, I can't, I can't go straight away and do it when I willfully sin. But no, scripture says, he doesn't give a time limit. it. Just go to God, confess your sin, and he who is gracious and just will forgive us from your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. We don't have to wait. We just go straight there as soon as we know. Third thing, Ananias and Sapphira's sin was birthed in their heart, even though it was displayed through their action or through their money. I think we often think that sin is an action, it's what we do or what we say. But actually, Sin is birthed in our heart. 
Now we have a choice when it's birthed there. Do we kill it dead immediately or do we nurture it and think on it? Think about it. Where does a baby grow? A baby grows in the womb where it's safe and it's secure. It's secure. The heart is like a womb uh, for sin. And if we're not careful, it will grow there in safety away from people's viewing until it is displayed to the world. Don't be fooled though. God can see the heart. People can't see the heart, but God can see the heart. And whilst we cannot stop sinful thoughts coming into our hearts that the enemy sows there, we can kill those thoughts as soon as we recognise them by sending them to the foot of the cross. As soon as we recognise them, we refuse to entertain them, we refuse to action them, and we send them to the foot of the cross. We're like, no, I recognise that thought in my heart is a sin. I'm not going to dwell on that. Father, forgive me. I'm sending that to the foot of the cross. As soon as we send those temptations to the foot of the cross, as soon as we ask for God's help with those things, God helps us. And there are so many things that we get tempted by, ways we can action. Perhaps we, we're tempted to withhold some money from the church and not give it in our tithes or offering. God sees that. We don't see it as a church, but God sees that. He sees the heart. Maybe uh, guys, or maybe ladies as well, we're tempted by uh, perhaps someone we see who perhaps isn't wearing a huge amount or is uh, flouting their features. And we can easily be tempted to think about that person in, in, in an immoral way. And as soon as we recognise and we think, oh, I'm, gonna be, I'm, gonna be I'm being tempted here, we take that, we say, God, please help me. Uh, we send that sin to the foot of the cross. And if we have sinned, if we have entertained that and sin has entered our heart and we've dwelt on that or we've actioned that, then we go to God and we ask him to forgive us. We're open with God about our sin. That's really, really important. And if we're struggling with sin, a consistent sin that regularly happens, something we're regularly happening with, then find somebody that we can treat as a mentor, who's someone who can disciple us and ask them for their help to hold us to account and recognise we don't need to be embarrassed by it. We need to recognise that we all struggle with sin. We all struggle with things. We all struggle with our thought life. Guys, if you struggle with your thought life, I'm sticking my hand up. I'm a guy too. I struggle with my thought life as well. And I need to send that uh, to the foot of the cross. I need to ask to God's help with that. Um, because that's the way, one of the ways the enemy will try and tempt me and I need to cut that off. Um, and Jesus has helped me to do that and he will help you to do that as well. I'm just making myself vulnerable there. Uh, guys, if you're in that position, come and talk to me. I'd love to try and help you with that area. Um, if not me, go and find somebody. Ladies, whatever those things that tempt you, if they're being becoming a habit, something that continually happens, go and find someone that you trust who can help you and hold you account in those areas. The fourth thing, uh, one of the ways that Satan discredits the church is through sin. Think about the sin of uh, child abuse or sexual scandals in the church that we hear about in the media. Where were those sins birthed? Those sins were birthed in the heart and they were entertained in the heart and they were actioned in secret and then they came out in public. Satan, who conceived that sin in the heart, wants to discredit the person and discredit the church by exposing that sin publicly and bringing shame on the church and shame on the person to discredit the ministry or the church and the Christian faith as a whole. In addition, that sin in our heart, we should remember this, that sin in the heart grows bigger and bigger if it's left unchecked. I mean, can you imagine a baby growing in the womb? If, if the baby wasn't birthed, if birth didn't happen, the baby would get bigger and bigger and bigger and leave less and less room for the woman. And of course, the mother would then become ill and, and eventually die. And so birth happens. Sin left unchecked will grow bigger and bigger. And then there'll be no room or less and less room for God to work out his purpose in our lives. That sin will become so all-consuming that, that we struggle to live that life at all that God wants us to live. And so that's why it's so important to cut that sin off before Satan has a chance to use it to discredit you, your ministry and all the church or even the Christian faith. The good news is that the church now is so great in size and influence that it can withstand controversy. For example, a controversy that happens in the church in America doesn't necessarily affect the church here uh, in England. Nevertheless, 
Satan wants to destroy the church and he is set on ruining its reputation and influence. However, the great news is that Jesus has said that the gates of hell will not overcome it. Amen? The gates of hell will not overcome the church. The power of God to protect his church, his people, is far greater than the power the devil has to try and destroy it. So if you're sitting there and you're thinking, I'm already struggling with sin and you're feeling down and you're feeling worthless and you're feeling like there's no hope, there is hope. The power of God in your life is greater than the power of sin and you can cut Satan off, you can cut his head off as far as that area of sin in your life is concerned uh, because the, the God is more powerful than the devil and through what Jesus did on the cross, he defeated Satan. He is a defeated foe and you and I stand in victory. Isn't that great news? And so we don't need to be worried. So today God uh, is saying to us that holiness and purity of thought and word and deed are as important now as they were back then in the early church. But by his grace, when we sin, we don't fall down dead as Ananias and Sapphira did. But we are still called to be set apart for God. We're still called to be witnesses through our conduct in our thought and word and deed. Let's not forget that. Let's not abuse the freedom that we have, the grace that God extends to us. Let's not say, well, you know, God will forgive us when we get around to asking for forgiveness. It's okay if I sin, God will forgive me. Let's not have an attitude like that. That is wrong and God will deal with that. That is sin. Let's not abuse his grace. But let's remember that because of his grace, we can come to him and ask for his forgiveness. He is greater than the enemy. He is greater than Satan. And we can cut that sin off with the help of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit will help us to deal with those issues. So as we close this morning, let me ask you the question, what business do you need to do with God in this whole area this morning? What do you need to ask forgiveness for? Because I'm sure we all have something we need to ask God forgiveness for. Ask God to help you live a life that is honourable to him in purity and holiness. Ask Jesus, ask the Holy Spirit, the helper, to help you. And he will help you. He will help you grow in these areas of purity and holiness. God bless you.